Good morning. This is Dr. Ron with the Cybersecurity Update for September 16th, 2022. And this is for my students, as well as other students around the world, uh, for researchers, professionals, and all learners of IT and IS, as well as cybersecurity, certainly. Today we have on the agenda three items. And one thing I'm going to do is not just present the three items and move on from there, but we'll have a little bit of a deeper conversation about what this means to us as cybersecurity professionals, what we could do about it, and other conversations around the scope. Flesh it out a bit. First off, Microsoft Patch fixes zero-day elevation of privileged vulnerabilities. Second, zero trust applied to the mobile world. And third, NIST suggests agencies accept uh, the word of software producers per executive order. Again, this series of videos is intended for all learners of cybersecurity. The focus is what we can learn from these cybersecurity incidents, what we can do to address them. All materials are copyrighted under the Fair Use Educational Clause. Information gathered is from publicly available sources. There's no sensitive information presented here. And links to all content that I've used are presented in the references section of this PowerPoint. If you want the PowerPoint, just drop me a note. Also, I've posted uh, the references in the YouTube area as well, so you have those. Leave me some comments about anything you want to see, any further explanation of items that I go through. I'll be glad to do a post, um, a small video, uh, even write a, a Medium article. A lot of times I write articles in Medium, which is a blog post. Okay, first off, item one, Microsoft Patch fixes zero-day elevation of privileged vulnerability. We've talked about zero-day uh, vulnerabilities before. They're undiscovered, uh, and uh, oftentimes you'll find them out on the dark web uh, initially uh, before cybersecurity researchers get a hold of them, companies get a hold of them, and, and apply the patches. Well, on September 13th, 2022, pretty recently here, multiple threat researchers, again, we talked about this before, uh, threat researchers, if you're a virus company, you have a research group. Uh, there's a lot of nonprofit research organizations as well as for-profit research organizations around cybersecurity. So several of them noted that uh, they discovered a vulnerability and the vulnerability was actually adapted, adopted as CVE 2022-37,969. We've talked about the uh, National Vulnerability Database. I'll emphasize some things here with this as well uh, for your educational enjoyment. According to Microsoft, the CVE 2022-37969 requires that an attacker already have access to a compromised system or the ability to run code on the target system. So they already have to be within the system. However, it was deemed to be a standalone and not related to other CVEs or exploits. So since this vulnerability requires a little skill, it is only a matter of time, as researchers have noted, that this vulnerability is exploited in a widespread notion by many threat actors. Microsoft released the patch for CVE 2022-37969 on September 13th, 2022. And we've talked in previous iterations about Patch Tuesday. That is actually a date for, that Microsoft release, releases a bulk of patches. The affected systems are Windows 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, Windows Server 2008 and 2012. Not too bad. That's a pretty broad scope. It's recommended that individuals or organizations update their Microsoft systems as soon as possible. First off, some actions that we can take as cybersecurity professionals in an organization. Certainly review security notices. Security notices come into awareness from several different fronts. As you can see on the screen, I put uh, several different sources, a SIM, SIEM SIM, potato, potato, a SIM, a security incident and event management tool. Uh, generally, it's a blend of software, hardware, threat intelligence, notices sent to an organization by a software or vendor, a notification sent by the National Vulnerability Database uh, based on the level indicated by the CVSS score. We talked about those with the National Vulnerability Database before. There is a score, uh, like a thermometer score, uh, when it's eight point and higher, it turns red. Uh, those need immediate patching. Um, so there's time frames noted in the CVSS score itself. A SIM is a solution. It can combine hardware and software. It helps organizations detect, analyze, and respond to security threats before they harm the business operations. Now, threat intelligence services, uh, that's a little bit on the newer front. Um, not brand new, but still on the newer front. This information, threat intelligence information, talks about the mechanisms of an attack. It's how to identify an attack that's happening 
presently. It's ways that different types of attack might affect the business. It's action-oriented advice about how to defend against attack. So uh, oftentimes on threat intelligence, it may not be a known vulnerability. It looks at patterns, heuristics to determine that an attack might be occurring. The National Vulnerability Database, we've discussed this before. NVD is a U.S. government repository of standards based on vulnerability management data. Again, I put NIST there. If you look at it, I put the links for uh, the National Vulnerability Database in the references if you want to look at that. Um, it's represented by using SCAP, Security Content Automation Protocol. There's a lot of tools that you can pull against or pull against the SCAP data and call your own information. That's worth looking at too as if you're a learner of cybersecurity practices. This data, the SCAP data, enables automation of vulnerability management, security measurement, and compliance. Matter of fact, I mentioned the open source SCAP tools that you can play with and work with just to see, but a lot of the products out there will use the SCAP data and there may be um, uh, open source as well as uh, a proprietary SCAP calling of that database content. It notices from vendors. If you're working in an information security environment, a cybersecurity environment, oftentimes you'll get hammered with many, many notices. You'll receive notices from vendors. Oftentimes those are plentiful, so you'll have to have a mechanism within the organization to work that through. Those notices will mitigate, provide mitigation strategies based on the vendor's security update recommendations. I also want to mention patch management process. We talked about this in an earlier iteration of our conversation. Here's a diagram of the patch management process. I'll say this is pretty generic right here. There are some twists and turns based on the tool that you use. So let's walk through the different phases here. Now, again, this item is available to you. Uh, first off, updates vulnerability details from vendors. That notion, that first arrow, vendors will often update their product, let's say a SIM for example, with known vulnerabilities, including vulnerabilities from the National Vulnerability Database. So they'll pull that. Uh, they'll also apply their own known vulnerabilities as well if those aren't documented in the NVD at present. Next, Scan the network. A periodic scan of the network is done to compare the known vulnerabilities, hardware, software, firmware, etc., to an established baseline of system objects in the information system. Now, I've mentioned this before. In an ideal situation, you'll have tools like Manage Engine, uh, other Cisco tools as well. Again, I'm mentioning Cisco with a little bit of bias here. Uh, that'll uh, create a baseline portfolio of your system objects, whether it's hardware, software, et cetera, in your system, as well as their patch uh, level, if you will. So the scan will be applied to that baseline and do a comparison contrast. Next, number three, identify the vulnerable systems. That scan, as well as the baseline, will reveal any components in the information systems that are vulnerable and that can be possibly patched. Oftentimes, not oftentimes, but sometimes there's not a patch available yet, so those need a particular attention. Second, oops, number four, download and deploy patches. This can be set up to be automatically done. Uh, let's read this through. The patch man management system will download relevant patches and will deploy those patches to information system components. That's in an ideal situation. You'll have a lot of variations of that. Also, you'll have uh, scheduling concerns. Do you want to apply the patches immediately or do you want to apply them over the weekend, perhaps when the organization's not very active? Uh, so next one, number five, generate status reports. Upon successful and I put or unsuccessful patching. A status report is generated to show the disposition of information system objects and any remaining vulnerabilities that were not addressed. So you have a baseline. Uh, let's say if you've got an information system, you captured the baseline, uh, you notice that 20 items, objects needed to be patched, updated. However, only 18 were patched, updated. That report should give you an indication of why those other two weren't patched or updated. The next item, item two, zero trust applied to the mobile world. The main tenet of zero trust, zero trust architecture, ZTA, is generally trust no one, hardware, software, objects, users, processes, etc., on the network, in the information systems, and simultaneously always verify. So trust nothing, verify always. In May 2021, 
Not too long ago, President Biden issued an executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity, requiring that the federal government implement ZTA across agency infrastructure. I made a few notes here on the bottom. The executive order is in the references section for your review. And also the NIST SP Special Publication 800-207, which is the guiding documents for zero trust architecture, is also in the reference section. I posted an earlier YouTube video on zero trust architecture as a primer for you. Look through that as well. There are several issues with uh, bring your own device to the organization. And those issues include employees do have the flexibility to access organizational resources, data, information, et cetera, remotely, or when they're teleworking. That's maybe the positive aspect, but not knowing the security pro profile of an employee's device, whether it's a cell phone or a laptop, can interject risk into the organization's network. Do we want that? There's ways to mitigate that. Uh, there's wireless LAN controllers, et cetera, that we can kind of tie, tie in a user's profile with their own devices. That gets into some heavy administrative complexity, plus other tools that you would need to support in an infrastructure. The NIST SP 1800-22, that special publication, is for mobile device security. That recommends organizations use both a standards-based approach and commercially available technologies like the wireless access controller as one technology to help meet their security and privacy needs when permitting personally owned mobile devices to access enterprise resources. So the bottom line, you don't know where somebody's been with their laptop, what they've been looking at, what they've been downloading, uh, what the posture is of their software, how the virus protection looks. So what that would require if you're allowing that in an organizational system is that you know the status and the posture. There are tools and techniques that when a person brings their own devices into an organization, uh, your process can include the scanning of of their equipment. Also, it could put an, a layer of software onto that device to manage and mitigate any kind of issues or concerns. That also opens up another can of worms. You have to get your user to sign off on that process, and you'd also have to keep updated in what technologies are brought on board with a BYOD policy. Personally, I in the work that I've done, I'd rather just keep that off the network. Item three. Now, this is fairly recent. I started looking at this last Friday when some of the documents were released because, as you know, I'm kind of a software geek. An executive order entitled The Executive Order on Improving the Nation's Cybersecurity, also in the references, was issued by President Biden on May 12, 2021. And there's the EO number. Uh, the intention of EO14028 uh, is to respond to the growing number of cyber attacks. And we've talked about in these cybersecurity updates of the plentiful number of cybersecurity uh, attacks, not only in, in organizations, but in the U.S. critical infrastructure, as well as the defense industrial base, DOD, etc. The EO establishes a framework for how government and the private sector should work together to improve the nation's cybersecurity posture. So the executive order just laid out, it's almost like a strategy. We've talked about IT strategies, set the policies and procedures uh, forward, if you will. So this, this sets up a strategic goal for the government to set up a framework. Again, this was a year plus ago. And what happened, uh, just kind of as an update, is on... This past Friday, NIST released five documents that focused a lot around software security as well as IoT device security. As you know, we've talked about IoT security in the past and how wonky that is because companies just want to slam out their product at the least cost and without any real concern for cybersecurity. So getting back to this, and by the way, this is from the narrative in a Medium article I posted, so I just copied it straight into here. I don't want to read you per se, but I'll read some highlights from it. And of course, like I always do, comment on things. Currently, contract terms and or contract restrictions may limit the sharing of cyber threat or incident information with executive departments and government agencies' responsibility for investigating or remediating, remediating cyber incidents, such as CISA, FBI, the Secret Service, other intelligence 
community members. In fact, one of the cybersecurity updates, we had uh, an issue with uh, the Secret Service talking to the FBI because of some of the regulations between those two departments. So we talked about that wonkiness that occurred. And by the way, Secret Service is dialed into the financial aspect. FBI, of course, is a crime organization. So that's how that parses together. The executive order focused on removing these restrictions, thank goodness, and has recommended that the FAR uh, council and other appropriate agencies such as DFAR, DFARS, for example, we talked about DFARS, the defense aspect, update proposed contracting language to emphasize the intention of the collaboration for cybersecurity between government and private parties. Just a side note, a lot of the contracts have spelled out the cybersecurity policies and restrictions of the data that's transmitted to and from agencies. What they're saying is with this executive order, Again, the strategic goals of this executive order is to not have all these barriers between agencies to develop that framework. And like we talked about before, who gets to develop that? NIST does. NIST develops the guidelines, the framework, not the strategy. They devise the goals, the opportunity. Now, the intention of the framework is to modernize and strengthen governmental cybersecurity standards by providing agencies with a common set of standards, a playbook, to protect data and systems. A main component of the executive order is the software supply chain, software security. We talked about, I have a couple of articles in Medium about secure software development. We've also had a couple of conversations about secure software development in both courses that I've taught as well as podcasts that I've presented. So this is actually kind of a good thing and this is what piqued my interest last Friday. Further, key access points are highlighted in the executive order to ensure that only trusted and verified software is used. This item notes a strong need for the secure software development life cycle. To this end, the executive order highlights and also notes that companies that use commercial off-the-shelf software, COTS, need to develop a SBOM, a software bill of materials, to track components and to ensure that suitable updates are appropriately applied in a timely manner. Now, software bill of materials, we've discussed that before, but in general concept, you have to know what every component is in your software object, your set of objects, and how they articulate. Further, you want to know the source of those objects. We talked about the uh, Cisco hacks and other software hacks that were using open source software and how those weren't really signed or actually culled through in order to ensure that the security posture of objects that were borrowed or used from uh, open source were not uh, securely uh, applied, if you will. So we also talked about signing of software in past presentations. The signing of software is a process where you have essentially a library that checks in, checks out, uh, software objects, DLLs for one, DLLs are often uh, a proponent <laughs> or a component in a, a hack. We had a hack last week that we talked about a DLL that was unsigned uh, where someone injected a DLL into the library that had malware embedded into that. So a DLL is a software object. The signing is a process of verifying that a piece of software is updated and also has uh, a particular hash total as one example of signing in order to ensure that that software has not been tampered with. We'll have another secure software development lifecycle uh, discussion in the future. So if you're missing that, just drop me a note. Uh, I'll send you information when that gets posted. Anyway, uh, I do have these one, two, three, four, five documents here that were released last Friday, September 9th. And I started calling through them. Of course, the volume of documents, the it's probably six or 800 pages. What I did was I thumbed through on my PDF reader um, uh, the executive summary and a lot of the key points. I also dialed in, in particular, the Secured Software Development Framework, SSDF. Now, I've referred to that as the SSDLC, which is kind of a mix and match. The, the development framework includes hardware. The SSDLC primarily focuses on software. So uh, we're looking at that in particular, the NIST SP802.18 as a guiding document for an upcoming uh, SSDLC item, if you will. I probably will retitle it the, to the SSDF as that encompasses the hardware device as well. So another item that I thought was of particular interest was, were the IoT uh, devices. Again, like I have mentioned before, uh, companies crank out IoT devices on the cheap without consideration for the security posture. Now it's 
being dialed in and a lot will have to adhere to these standards as well. Cybersecurity labeling of consumer software, what that refers to is uh, labeling objects primarily. For example, in Oracle classes, we talked about Oracle has labeling of particular entities, attributes in their relational database management system. That way you know they're not tampered with. Other database products have that same type of labeling or signing as well. This gets into a deeper cut on that labeling. The consumer cybersecurity labeling pilots, that's more of an approach and feedback. So really the essential documents are not only the executive order on top, First off, the 800-218, as well as secondly, the ILT uh, device and products. Imagine the government having to really dial in on this, and I think it's great. It's going to impact the entire mar market. This slide just highlights the five documents. By the way, the documents NIST dial this in. NIST takes the strategic goals, let's say the executive order, and then uh, starts carving out how those will be implemented. Management then will take the NIST guidance and work with that. NIST highlights self-attestation, what they call first-party attestation uh, for software producers, as they call it. So software developers, the producers, will have to attest based on a set of controls, which haven't been really clearly delineated yet. So let's say if I'm producing uh, accounting software that the government uses, I might have to run through, let's say it's 200 controls. The 200 controls to verify that I've met all the software signing, the software bill of material items, the secure software development lifecycle items that the government has on that list of controls. I self-attest. I provide the government with a statement that it's self-attested uh, to, uh, very much like the current DVARS NIST 800-171 R2 that we've talked about that um, vendors and producers of uh, items for the government have to go through. Now, this is a whole list of hard to read text. My apologies here. One of the things, first off, I do see a spell check error in here, so my apologies. I do have an OMB, an Office of Management and Budget. Let me go ahead and correct that spelling here. Oops, because that'll bug me forever. Uh, a memo dated just a few days ago uh, that really states, and I want to read this to you. If the software producer cannot attest to one or more practices from the NIST guidance uh, identified in the standard self-attestment attestation form. By the way, I looked at that self-attestation form. It's not really clearly delineated yet. I think they still need some work. The requesting agency shall, shall require the software producer to identify those practices to which they cannot attest, document practices they have in place to mitigate these risks, and require a POAM, Plan of Action and Milestones, to be developed. Now, what the problem is that I see as glaring is that if you're an agency, let's say you're the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, and you're using software, uh, if it's not fully, quote, in compliance, first party attestation, the onus is up to the agency to set up a uh, review of the poem uh, and of uh, best practices that the software vendor, software producer has uh, per used, if you will. So I think this is kind of a wonky wonkiness in this whole thing, if you will. Also, the member further states, if the software producer supplies that documentation and the agency finds it satisfactory, the agency may use the software despite the producer's inability to provide a complete self-attestation. Is that wonky or what? So they're saying on one hand, the software producer has to self-attest to the viability of their software based on the guidance provided by NIST, the controls, if you will. I don't think the controls are fully fleshed out yet. And if they're not completely satisfactory to an agency that uses the software, the agency can call for a review and still use the software. So I scratch my head on the, the veracity, the viability of this approach. It still seems like it has some holes in it. So in general, this, these are my comments here. An external review group, perhaps outside of the individual agency, should review the submitted self-attestations to ensure that software vendors are following the list of compliance and controls. I think some, this really calls for, and I, I don't like it, more government, but I think there needs to be an oversight group to look at all the software vendors, all of the software producers. And if you extend that to producers of IoT, SCADA devices as well, which have known holes in the security posture. We really need to button this up because it's still very wiggly. 
Uh, so I wanted to bring this up as a cybersecurity issue for all of us because in the software development world, uh, we need to eventually adhere to governmental standards. It's coming down the pike eventually. Ultimately, I believe, just my own personal, personal comments, and by the way, if you've talked to any cybersecurity person, everyone seems to have their own opinions, don't we? <laughs> but I, I think just being in the, the world of cybersecurity, ultimately, I would not be surprised if there's a national cybersecurity standard, very much like other uh, uh, countries have adopted. So that's it for today's cybersecurity update. Any feedback, any thoughts and comments, please share them. Uh, drop me an email. You can link with me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have any kind of brief presentations you would like me to kind of go over and present, I'd be glad to do that. I have a list of Medium articles as well. Look at those. Um, keep in contact. Certainly my students have my school email. So if you're my student, please contact me. Keep me posted what you're up to. Even afterwards, by the way, for my students, uh, I've had a lot of students keep in touch with me for 10, 15 years. I love that. Keep in touch with me through LinkedIn as well. If you're doing some sort of training course, I'd like to hear what you're tr training on. Are you doing a CCNA, CCNP? Are you working on A+, any other kind of CISSP, et cetera? So keep me posted. I'd like to be in the loop. Also, for my own use, I'm not like this famous YouTuber, but please like and share. Uh, the intention is to really see if my video content is getting through and if it's usable. I want to know. Subscribe. You'll also get notifications of new posts. I try to post once or twice a week and keep in contact in, in any way, shape, or form. And finally, here's a list of references. I'll post these in the YouTube notes as well. If you need this PowerPoint, just drop me a note. Have a good day. Signing off. Thank you.